Good morning. So, up until this point, we've been thinking of bonds as simply shared pairs of electrons between atoms. And this is a very good model of structure. This is a very good model of structure and bonding. Works very nicely. Easy for us to quickly generate structures. Today we're going to take a slightly deeper look at structure and bonding, and we're going to look at orbital-based models of structure and bonding. So the idea of orbital-based models of structure and bonding is that bonding occurs because of the greater stability Now we've seen this approach to understanding uh, structure and bonding before. We've seen it in general chemistry. And the basic principle is this focuses on the wavelength properties of electrons. In other words, we think of our electrons as being spread out. We don't think of them as just two dots gluing atoms together, but rather that when you have an arrangement of atoms that the electrons move around and just like an electron in the hydrogen atom wants to be in the 1s orbital so it can be near to the nucleus, in a molecule it wants to be in a bigger orbital so it can be near to the many nuclei and it's all spread out. Let's go back to what I'm sure you've seen in general chemistry and we'll look at molecular hydrogen too. So we've represented that structure already by H bonded to H. So let's take a look at an orbital-based approach to understanding the structure and bonding of hydrogen. So we can think of molecular hydrogen as being formed by combining two hydrogen atoms. And to do that, we bring together the two nuclei of the hydrogens and add the electrons. So here's one hydrogen atom. I'll write this as H dot, meaning that we have hydrogen with one electron. What I've tried to represent here is the 1s atomic orbital. I'll write that as 1s AO for the hydrogen atom. And so that electron spends some time near the nucleus and sort of all smeared out around the nucleus. And we have two of these. Like so. When we combine the two hydrogen atoms then, we get a new molecular orbital where now here are our hydrogen atoms. We 
we have a new molecular orbital that encompasses, that wraps up the two hydrogen nuclei. We call this the sigma 1s molecular orbital. Sigma is a designation for an orbital that is cylindrically symmetric. By cylindrically symmetric, I mean like this piece of chalk, or at least this piece of chalk before I started writing and breaking the symmetry. If I spin it around on its axis, it's the same no matter how you look at it, or a big sausage, a uh, big fat salami. As you spin it around, it's cylindrically symmetric. So when we combine two atomic orbitals, the 1s atomic orbitals, we get two molecular orbitals. So you need to combine your atomic orbitals in two different ways. And the way you can combine them is either an additive fashion or a subtractive <coughs> fashion. So we've added them together. We've gone and said we have this orbital, we have this orbital, we bring them together, we mix them together, we get some orbital that encompasses the two nuclei. This orbital, of course, is a representation of where the electron is likely to be found. I'm limited by the limits of the blackboard, but you can think of this as a cloud where the electron can be found and where some places there's a higher probability. Think of it as a ball of cotton candy you might get at a fair where you have fluffiness or a cloud where you have less probability of finding the electron way, way out here. There's always some probability, more probability closer. Now let's play with the idea of combining the orbitals in a subtractive fashion. And this is where students usually find the notions a little bit confusing. So here are our two 1s atomic orbitals. But let us now imagine subtracting one from the other. In order to do that, we can just think, so this is a minus sign here. In order to do do this, we can just think of adding the negative of this orbital. This is confusing because you have to be thinking about orbitals as waves on the ocean. You have to think a wave can go up, a wave can go down. And two wave tops that are up could interact with each other. Two wave tops that are down could interact with each other. But a wave top that's up and a wave top that's down doesn't, bottom I suppose, that's down, doesn't interact. So I'm going to shade. So here, let me add a plus sign to say that we're adding them together. Here I've used a minus sign. And here, what I'm going to do is use a plus sign, but shade this orbital to indicate a negative phase. Now when we do that, what I mean is there's electron density here, there's electron density here, but if I bring them together, they can't overlap. There's an area where there's no electron density. And let me represent that addition by sort of a teardrop shaped structure like this. This is another molecular orbital. It's an anti-bonding molecular orbital. It's anti-bonding because we don't share electron density between the nucleus, nuclei, because it's higher in energy for orbital electrons to be in this molecular orbital than it is to be in the sigma 1s molecular orbital. We call this orbital the sigma star molecular orbital, the sigma star 1s molecular orbital. And whenever you combine two atomic orbitals, you get a bonding orbital 
and an anti-bonding molecular orbital. Normally, we can often forget, and we very quickly do forget about the anti-bonding molecular orbitals. In fact, I'll be making some drawings in just a few moments where we do ignore those for the sake of simplicity. Let's see why we can ignore them very often. So here's an orbital energy diagram of the molecule hydrogen. On my y-axis, I'll represent energy. This is the energy of a hydrogen atom, 1s atomic orbital. And we can think of the hydrogen atom as having one electron in it. Here we have another, the same level, hydrogen 1s atomic orbital. And we can think of that as having one electron. When we bring those two hydrogen atoms together, we get our sigma and our sigma star 1s molecular orbitals. The sigma star 1s molecular orbital is lower in energy. Oops, sigma 1s molecular orbital is lower in energy. The sigma star 1s molecular orbital is higher in energy. In other words, we brought these two atomic orbitals together in forming our H2 molecule. We have two electrons. We put those two electrons in the 1s molecular orbital, in the sigma 1s molecular orbital, and they are lower in energy. In other words, the net configuration more stable. Thoughts or questions? Great question. Is there ever a time when the anti-bonding molecular orbital is filled? So the answer to that question is yes. If I give the molecule hydrogen another electron, the only place it can go is into the anti-bonding orbital. And yet the net energy of this configuration with two bonding interactions, two electrons in the bonding orbital, and one electron in the anti-bonding molecular orbital is still more stable than H minus and H dot. So there we would have a bond even. It would be half a bond in strength even with one electron in the anti-bonding molecular orbital. You learned about helium in general chemistry. Everyone learned that hydrogen forms a bond between two hydrogen atoms, and helium doesn't. And you probably saw a diagram very similar to the diagram that I put up here, probably with the <coughs> professor writing HE and HE, and showing each of these with two electrons, and showing that if you bring the two heliums together, you have two electrons in the sigma 1s, two electrons in the sigma star 1s, so there's no bonding interactions. The heliums don't bond. And then the professor probably said to you, but if you take away one electron, if you make the molecule He2+, it is actually a stable species because you have an net bonding interaction. So yes, there are times. And when you get to learning about aromaticity and the molecule benzene, you will start to learn about putting electrons into the pi star molecular orbitals. Other questions? All right, let us now turn our attention to organic molecules.
in order to think about organic molecules, we're going to have to introduce one more concept, also from general chemistry, the concept of hybrid orbitals. start with the molecule methane, CH4. So the molecule methane has a tetrahedral arrangement of hydrogen atoms around a central carbon, four hydrogen atoms. I'm representing the hydrogens in the plane of the blackboard with normal sorts of bonds to the hydrogens. To show the three-dimensionality of the molecule, I'm representing the hydrogen that's coming out of the blackboard with a wedged bond to it, and the hydrogen that's going back into the blackboard with a dashed bond to it. In order to think about forming four bonds in methane, the easiest way to think about it, now you've got three p orbitals, and those p orbitals aren't in tetrahedral relationships to each other, they're at right angles to each other. The three p orbitals are coming from the carbon, they're the 2s, or the 2p orbitals of carbon. We also will use, remember, hydrogen is bringing four electrons and four atomic orbitals, four valence atomic orbitals to the table. We're also going to use the 2s atomic orbital. And so the way we think about this is that we're going to mix our 2s, our 2px, our 2py, and 2pz atomic orbitals to form four sp3 hybrid orbitals. of a tetrahedron. So now it's very easy for us to think about forming the bonds in methane. We can think of forming the bonds as combining each of the sp3 orbitals, the hybrid orbitals on carbon, with a 1s orbital on hydrogen. Let me draw this out. And for the sake of visibility, I'm only going to draw two of the four sp3 hybrid orbitals and two of the hydrogens. So here's one of the sp3 hybrid orbitals. Remember the p orbitals, just like we had a negative phase here, the p orbitals have a negative phase and a positive phase on them. We'll see that again when we talk about ethylene. So in the sp3 hybrid orbitals, we also have a small negative phase low and a big positive phase low. Here's one of our sp3 hybrid orbitals. Here's another. And I can combine them, so I'll just put a label on this, sp3. And I'll point out that there are two more that I'm not drawing. And then I'll imagine combining those sp3 orbitals with the hydrogen. So here's our hydrogen, and this is the 1s atomic orbital. And I'll do the same over here. And again, although I'm not going to draw it out, we will combine the sp3 
hybrid orbital and the hydrogen 1s orbital in either an additive fashion that produces net overlap or a subtractive fashion that produces negative net overlap to in turn create two molecular orbitals. And we'll only focus on the, the bonding orbitals. These bonding orbitals might be thought of then as just pushing the hydrogen's atomic orbital together. In other words, making a big orbital that encompasses this and having a little bit of a negative flow. Thoughts on this process? attention now to a second organic molecule. These organic molecules I'm taking are archetypes of the types of structure and bonding you're going to encounter. And so each of them is demonstrating a different principle. So let's now look at ethylene. CH2, CH2. I'll be good for now. I'm going to write it as H2C, double bond H2C. Most organic chemists, and indeed I, most of the time, am going to write this as CH2, double bond CH2. Implicit in such a drawing is that the hydrogens are on the outside, but they're not participating in the bonding. So we're going to use the 2s and two of the p orbitals on each carbon to make three sp2 hybrid orbitals. And for the sake of geometry, I'm going to call it the 2px the two PYs. So initially in our drawing, we'll set the plane of the blackboard as the XY plane. That's arbitrary. So we're combining the 2S, the 2PX, and the 2PY atomic orbitals to get three SP2 hybrid orbitals. Then we'll combine those three sp2 hybrid orbitals with the hydrogen 1s orbitals to get the sigma bond framework and with each other. with the hydrogen 1s, 
And we'll do the same over here. And then we'll overlap one carbon with another carbon. And so I will draw its sp2 hybrid orbitals like so. So we're going to overlap here to form a sigma bond between the carbons. We're going to overlap with the hydrogen 1s orbital to form another sigma bond. And we're going to overlap over here. So that gives us our sigma framework of the molecule. What I've just drawn now is equivalent to this. And exactly, we still have a pot the unused 2PZ orbitals. We still need to form our double bond. And so let's look at how we form the double bond. What I'm going to do now is shift our plane of reference for the sake of drawing. So here's the molecule on this blackboard. I'm going to go ahead onto this blackboard, bring the molecule so it's like this. And now, in other words, it now, instead of having the XY plane in the blackboard, now I'm going to draw it so the XZ plane is in the back blackboard. I'm going to represent that sigma framework like so. With the hydrogen, remember the wedge means coming out, the dash means coming back. So here's the sigma framework of our ethylene molecule. We now have you, we have the two PZ orbitals, and we use the two PZ orbitals to form the pi bond. So we can combine the two PZ orbitals. <coughs> and if we overlap them in an additive fashion, meaning so that the lobes of the same phase, the positive phase and the negative phase, can overlap, we get our pi molecular orbital. I'll draw that out. molecular orbital can be thought of as having a cloud above the carbons of electrons, a cloud of electrons below the carbon. You have a wave-like property where the electrons can be here, the electrons can be here, but the electrons have no electron density right in the plane of the molecule, zero probability, you have what's called a node. So you have a node in the plane of the molecule. And indeed, the pi orbital has a plane of symmetry. So I'll just label this as nodal plane. I haven't drawn it, but you also combine the p orbitals to make the pi star orbital. In the pi star orbital, you get an additional nodal plane over here, and you have an anti-bonding interaction between the two carbons. So in that line on the left, In the drawing on the left, the p, p orbitals or the pi orbital are coming right out of the blackboard, just like I'm holding the chalk. And I simply, for the sake of viewing, flip the molecule. Other questions? A nodal plane? Ah, okay. Let's go back to our p atomic orbitals. Remember from general chemistry, your p uh, atomic orbitals. 
In your 2p atomic orbital, your electrons could be here, your electrons can be here, but your electrons can't be right at the carbon. That carbon constitutes a, and indeed, this plane constitutes a nodal plane. It means there is a region of zero probability of binding the electrons. This is the thing that's conceptually hard to understand about orbitals. It's that we're thinking about the wave-like properties of electrons. And if you've ever held a string and made it do a second harmonic, if you've ever wiggled an oscillator in physics and had it, it do a second harmonic where one point of the string is going up and down, so I've stretched a string between my hands, the string is going up and down very fast, one part is going up and down, the other part is going up and down, but right at the center there's a point where the string isn't moving. That's the second harmonic, and that's a node right in the center of that wave. What's hard to accept is you say, well, how do the electrons, if you think of them as particles, how do they get from the top to the bottom? And in thinking in a wave-like model, it's not that the electrons are one place or the other place. They're both places at the same time with varying probabilities. Ah, okay. This is a representation. So the this whole structure that looks like a hamburger, where you've got a bun on top, a bun on the bottom, and a hamburger patty in the center. The whole structure is representing the molecule. These two structures, the two buns, are representing the pi bonding orbital. And so the electrons in the pi, so we brought in two p electrons. We brought in two electrons. Those two electrons are here, and they're here, and they're in both places. They're never right here. The antibonding orbital, the pi star molecular orbital, I haven't drawn. The pi star molecular orbital looks something like this. And so, in addition to having electron, having a nodal plane here, you have a nodal plane at the axis, at the center of the molecule. So this is your representation of your pi star molecular orbital and ethylene. So what I've done here, just as we ignored our anti-bonding orbitals that were created in doing our overlap here, just as we've ignored our anti-bonding <coughs> orbitals here, we're ignoring them in this drawing. They exist, but there are no electrons in the anti-bonding molecular orbitals. So we're saying, let's, for the sake of simplicity, only draw representations of the bonding molecular orbitals. Other questions? These are good. This is the hard stuff for people, conceptually. The pi orbitals are in the plane of the blackboard, but they also go out. So think of it as a cloud. Think of this like as a, a rain cloud, centered in the blackboard, but fluffily sticking out, sticking back. So it's a big region where the electrons can be in. All right, let us try one more archetype of an organic molecule, we'll take acetylene.
once again, for starters, I'm going to be good and write out the molecule in a way that's a little bit more intuitive. You'll probably see it written in the future as CH triple bond CH rather than HC triple bond CH. But let me start by making it simpler. All right, in order to make the structure of acetylene, we're going to do the same type of things that we did for ethylene. We're first going to make the sigma framework with hybrid sp orbitals now, and then we're going to make the pi bond, pi bonds, the two pi bonds, using the remaining two p orbitals. So we'll take the two s, and I'll say the 2PY for the reference frame I've been drawing, atomic orbitals on carbon, and we'll make two SP hybrid orbitals. And we'll combine them again with each other and with the hydrogen 1S atomic orbitals to make the sigma bond framework. orbitals, which in this case are the 2PX and 2PZ orbitals, and that will lead to the two pi bonds. And I'll give a little bit of an abbreviated drawing here, where now all I've done is to overlap it's going to be a little hard to see because actually I think what I'm going to do is say we're going to make, here's our one SP. It's hard to draw because our other SP is like this. So basically on the same carbon you have two SPs, one pointing one way, one pointing the other. So I'm just going to draw our sigma bond framework out of the combination of the SPs with each other and with the hydrogen 1s orbitals. So this is the carbon on the left. I pointed 1sp at the sp on the other carbon. I've used the other sp to make a bond to the hydrogen. And then I'm just going to combine, here's our 2px, and then I'm going to combine the 2px, so that will lead to the pi bond, and then here's our 2pz, and I've got to try to represent three dimensions in two, which is always very hard, so the pz is pointing out, and the pz is pointing out, and I will combine those much as we did on the right-hand blackboard get our other pi bond. Thoughts or questions on acetylene? Um, I was wondering, um, does it matter if one becomes a pi bond and it's from 50x, 50 or 50 Great question. Does it matter which ones become the pi bond, the 2px, the 2py, or the 2pz? No, it's arbitrary based on my choice of the reference frame here. So based on my drawing and saying the blackboard's the xy plane, we could have easily written the molecule in a different orientation or set our axes differently. So we combine, say, 
the um, PY and the PZ or the PX and the PY and use those to make the pi bonds. So there's no specific order? <coughs> there's no specific order. The, the main thing to keep in mind, so this is a good question, the main thing to keep in mind is we're using that sigma, that 2s orbital, to make our sigma framework. That's the low energy one. That's the one that's relatively low in energy. The 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz are all equal in energy and therefore equivalent. But we definitely, because the sigma framework produces the best overlap, we definitely want to use the 2s, the lowest energy atomic orbital, in making up that sigma framework. Ah, uh, how many sp orbitals do we have total? This carbon brings two sp orbitals. This carbon brings two sp orbitals, so we have four total. We use one of those sp hybrid orbitals on this carbon to make the CH bond. We use the other one to make the CC bond. Then we use one of the two s orbit of the sp orbitals on this carbon to make the CH bond, and one to make the CC bond. I'm sorry? How do they, how do the two SPs Overlap. So how do we make the carbon-carbon sigma bond? So we make the carbon-sigma bond by overlapping this sp and this sp. And when we overlap them, we get a region of high probability of having the electrons that's right in the center of the two carbons. And then you also get an anti-bonding orbital, which we are ignoring for the sake of simplicity. All right, let's do one last thing, and that's let's take a look at a relationship now between bond hybridization, between orbital hybridization and bond strength, and between bond order and bond strength. So let's start with the CH bond strength. The strength of a bond is literally how much energy it takes to rip the bond into two equal halves. By equal halves, you may have different atoms, but I mean that each atom gets one electron. So if we have a CH bond, we rip it into C dot plus H dot. And I'm making this distinction right now because in the next chapter, in the next lecture, we're going to start to talk about acidity. And in acidity, we rip apart bonds unequally. We take off not a hydrogen atom, but an H plus, leaving behind a lone pair of electrons. And there, the rules are very different. But let's look at bond strength, where we rip a bond, a bond apart homolytically, equally, rather than heterolytically, unequally. The strength of a CSP3 hydrogen bond bond to hydrogen is about 98 kilocalories per mole. What's interesting and what's important is that if we use an sp2 hybrid orbital in making that bond, 
the CH bond gets stronger. The energy to rip that bond apart homolytically, to break it into a carbon dot and a hydrogen dot, goes up to 104 kilocalories per mole. Why is that? Well, remember, I said that the s orbital, it goes up from 98 kilocalories to 104 kilocalories per mole. In other words, if I rip a CH bond in methane, it takes 98 kilocalories per mole of energy. If I rip a CH bond in ethylene, it takes 104 kilocalories per mole of energy. The exactly because they're in a lower energy orbital. The sp2 is lower in energy than the sp3. Why? More stable. It has more s character. Remember we said s is lower than p. The sp3 orbital has 25% s character and 75% of the higher energy p character. The sp orbital has 33% of the lower energy s character and 66 or 66.66% 66 .66 of the higher energy p character. So we're in a lower energy atomic orbital. It makes a lower energy molecular orbital. When we rip that bond apart, we have to break a more stable bond. Finally, if we look at a C S P whoops C S P hydrogen bond, that bond is even more stable. It's 125 kilocalories per mole. To rip that bond apart in a homolytic fashion, to rip it apart to get C dot and H dot. You'll later learn that that bond actually is exceptionally acidic to rip apart in a heterolytic fashion. That's a different story. Let's take a look at single, double, and triple bonds. We saw a single bond in methane, and we've seen single bonds in ethane. I'll take carbon-carbon single bonds, because that's going to give us a nice comparison. The carbon-carbon single bond is 88 kilocalories per mole. The carbon-carbon double bond in ethylene is 152 kilocalories per mole. In other words, the extra pi bond in ethylene adds about 60 kilocalories per mole stability. say about 60 kilocalories per mole. Why am I being a little dicey with the numbers? Well, the sigma bond's a little stronger in ethylene, too, because in the sigma bond in ethylene, we're using those stronger sp2 hybrid orbitals. We're making a stronger sigma bond. So we don't know the exact difference, but the difference is about 60 kilocalories per mole. Now this is interesting because it says, wow, the pi bond isn't as strong as the sigma bond, and that's consistent with what we see over here. Those electrons aren't shared as well between the carbons. They're not directly between them. They're above and below. And then just to complete the set, We'll look at acetylene, and we'll look at the triple bond, and that's 200 kilocalories per mole. 
And so adding yet another pi bond increases the stability, but not as much as by a sigma bond. The sigma bond is giving us about 60. The third pi bond is giving us somewhere on the order of uh, The sigma bond is giving us about 90. The third pi bond is giving us about 50. All right, next time we'll talk about molecular geometry, and then we're going to move on to talk about chapter two, the strengths of